Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit to teach us or to reteach us this lesson, this life-changing truth that has changed my life so deeply the day I learned it. And I pray that it will reactivate the hearts of the people that are here tonight and change their lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That means not being strong in your own strength, but realizing that your strength comes from the Lord. This is a lesson I learned as a baby Christian that totally changed my life, and I still live by it today. i got to get my strength from God, and there's a particular way that we can, we can access God's strength. And it's in Proverbs, in chapter 18, and verse 21. Go ahead and flip there real quick. We're going to come back to Ephesians. We'll just put it up on the screen. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. And those who love it shall eat its fruit. When I got the revelation of the power of my words, because of what God says about my words, it changed my life. This is one of the greatest lessons you can learn from the Word of God, is your words have power to kill or to bring life. Amen. The two extremes, to destroy or to build. And usually our arguments, the trouble we get into is because of the, what's been running out of our mouth or somebody else's mouth. Amen. We deal with our own sin. We deal with the sins of others against us. And we deal with the fact that we live in a fallen world that's full of sin. And the world wants you to speak the world's way, but God wants you to speak the word of God. He wants you to speak his way. Now, do you understand how powerful that scripture is right there when he says death and life are in the power of God? Or no, he says in the power of the tongue. And those who love it shall eat its fruit. You're eating what you're saying. Amen. You're becoming what you're saying. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, is what the Bible says. And with the way you think, thoughts come, you take thoughts, then you put those thoughts into words. When you speak those words, you release something into the spirit world, into the atmosphere that you've got to deal with. The warfare that we're having, spiritual warfare is a warfare of words, a confession, a profession. Now, we could call it communication. Let's say somebody says, well, uh, I can't speak, but you can still communicate through your actions, through words, different ways of communicating. And what you believe in your heart and the way you can communicate that out is what you're going to be. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's not what goes in a man that defiles a man, not what you eat, but what comes out of a man that defiles a man, what comes out of his mouth. Because what we eat, Jesus said, goes in our mountain, then it comes out the other end. But in our heart, we have all this other stuff. And from our heart comes evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders. All of this comes out of the heart, which comes out of our mouth. How many of y'all got that revelation or learned it as you grew as a Christian, that you had to start bridling your tongue? If you do the same thing you've always done, you'll have the same results you've always had. How many of y'all have heard that before? So if you're always talking about the same thing over and over again, you're going to have what you say, and your life isn't going to change. You've got to change something today if you want your tomorrow to change. And the first thing you need to change is what's in your heart. Get the Word of God in your heart so it can come out of your mouth. And when you start changing the way you talk, your life will change. It really will. But let me tell you, the tongue... It's hard to tame. James talks about that. So th this is so beautiful when he says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. In, in, in a lesson Jesus was teaching his disciples, he was walking by and there was a fig tree off and it looked like it had figs on it. And he went over there, didn't have any figs on it. And Jesus said, let no man eat of you again. The next day they're walking by. And Peter says, the tree you cursed is dried up at the root. He said, you cursed it. Now, now, now let me tell you, Jesus, you thought, would only speak life? 
No, Jesus will speak death to that which will get you off track. And you sometimes got to curse those things that get you off track too. Amen? You, 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 that just because you curse something doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Let me tell you, if ca cancer's getting in your body, curse that cancer. Sickness and disease, trespass and curse that sickness, that disease. Take authority over that spirit of infirmity and cast it out. And you do that with words. Now, if you don't believe in demons, then you're never going to cast one out. That's why when we look at, uh, go back to Ephesians now, go back to, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So I got to get God's word in my mouth. I got to believe what God says and understand that every dotting of the eye, every crossing of the T, every word of God is going to come to pass. There's power in God's words. Amen. So for me to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, I have to put his word in my mouth. Next verse, it says, put on the whole armor of God. How many of y'all know how to put on your armor? That you may be, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the devil has a plan. He has schemes. He, he wants to destroy your family, destroy your life, destroy your ministry, destroy what you're doing. He comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. And guess what? When we're speaking like the devil, guess what we're doing? We're letting him bring death, steal, kill, and destroy. But when you start speaking live, guess what happens? You rebuke the devil and then... God's holy angels, God himself, the Holy Spirit, God's word begins to come to pass. In fact, in, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus Christ is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Amen. It means he's watching over what we're saying to cause it to come to pass. When you start speaking God's word by faith, God will begin to perform his word because his word will not return to him void. His word is what? A lamp into my feet. It's a light into my path. Or what are you walking on? Are you walking on the word or are you walking on the world's plan for your life? This, this revelation is, some of y'all said, well, I, I know all about this, but I want to remind you again. Thank you, Lord. You know, because I, I get around myself sometimes. So, oh, I've got to get my tongue back under control. I mean, any argument that I have with Stacy is usually because of something I said or she said that started that tongue. How I many you know the tongue can get you in trouble? Yeah. You ever put your foot in your mouth? Yeah. There's some, I still taste it from some time. <laughs> so there's power. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So here we are. We've got power in our tongue. When we're speaking God's word, the angels of God are, are there to perform it. When we're speaking not God's word, we're speaking death, the fallen angels, the demons are there to cause it to come to pass. And you know the word devil means accuser of the brethren. Amen. And that's all he does uh, according to uh, uh, the book of Revelation. He accuses us before God day and night. And when we start accusing one another, he loves that because then he can get in. Sunday morning, I talked about sin lies at the door. When we get angry, our countenance falls, it's crouched down like an animal, ready to spring forth and bring destruction. And that was Cain. And, and the Lord said to Cain, he says, sin's right there. It's crouched down at the door. It's like a demon waiting. He says, but if you do well, will you not be accepted? But he didn't do well, did he? Because when anger comes, the next thing you know, you're going to start saying things that are not true. Because he lies to God right after that. Because God says, where's your brother? I don't know. Lie. Father of lies already in his mouth. Lying is, is a pretty serious thing. Amen. Amen? Is it okay, a little white lie? Huh? Those yeah. are... We need to try to do our best to tell the truth. And I saw that, I saw that uh, uh, demonstrated to me this week so beautifully. There was a, somebody that could have just said a little bit. Almost it wouldn't have it really been a lie. Almost a little, just something they could have got, taken advantage of something. And I saw them hold their integrity and tell the absolute truth. And God blessed them even more. We need to do it God's way. 
It's like somebody who goes to court and they sit on the stand. Are you going to tell them what you want them to hear so you can get away with what you've done wrong, or are you going to tell them the truth? Ooh. Oh, they raise their hand. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So forgive me, God, because I'm about not to tell them the truth. No, so help me, God. And it becomes what's legal in the land instead of what's righteous with God. There's two ways of doing things. It's God's way, your way. Well, there's three ways. God's way, your way, and the devil's way. And there's only one good way, God's way. Look at this next scripture. Go to the next one. He says, For we do not fight or wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we are fighting invisible entities all the time that are trying to destroy us. The devil's always right there, a devil. We're not going to say the devil because he's not omnipresent. But there are going to be spiritual forces. Crouch down waiting, especially when you get angry. So he says, when you get angry, the apostle says in the same book, sin not and don't give any place to the devil because he's crouched down, waiting to jump in to steal, kill, and destroy. And let me tell you, you've got to bridle this tongue. Because when you're angry, that's whenever you just let it go. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Ooh, that's when you say things that you wish you would have never said after you finish. So when you find that going on, you've got to Broadle your tongue. Get back in the spirit and start speaking God's word over things. It's difficult. You get in the middle of an argument and you, you remember Pastor Mark saying, whenever you're arguing, just stop arguing and start praying. When you're in the middle of an argument and you, you're angry and you, your voice is raised up, you don't feel like stopping and praying. You want to tell them what you want to tell them. And then whenever you do stop and start praying, they kind of make fun of you like, you're just doing that because Pastor Mark said you don't really mean it. See the, see the tongue? And really, true repentance is getting out of the flesh, getting back in the spirit. I mean, if you, and the way we need to do that sometimes, just shut your mouth. Just get your mouth quiet. Then he says, you want to do this, we're wrestling against all these spiritual forces. In verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girt your waist with the truth. We need to be speaking the truth, living the truth. Then it says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that it's not your own righteousness, but his. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Do you know how to share the gospel with other people? Get your shoes on. Quit walking around barefooted. Learn the gospel. Be able to share it. I like this. Above all, take up the shield of faith, which is able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Because you, you know those buttons that the people in your life press that make you angry? That set off your tongue? The things that do that? you got to pick up your shield of faith so whenever those arrows come at you, they're quenched. And you can just be quiet. Easier said than done, huh? So he says, above all, take up the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And it says, then take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pick up that sword and put it in your mouth. Amen. That's your weapon. That's your offensive weapon. That's how you can overcome. You begin to speak God's Word. You pick it up and put it in your mouth. And you got all in all, you can have all, all your armor on, but if you don't get that sword in your mouth, you're not going to make any advancements. You might not get hurt as bad, but you want to you push through. You want to grow. You got to get the word of God in your mouth. And he says, so it says, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So he's saying we've got to pray. We've got to put the word of God in our mouth, release the word of God. And for me, that utterance may be given to me. See what words come out of my mouth. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Let me tell you, there are people that don't want the plain, simple gospel. They don't. They're offended at it. There's people that rather have religion than gospel. 
It's too easy to believe that God will save you by grace, through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? Amen. I'm going to preach the Bible, and if you don't agree with your religion, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend you, but if the word offends you, let the word offend you. Amen. But see, some people have more than one book. They don't just have the Bible. And if that's what you're going to believe, that's okay with you. But we don't believe that here. We believe that the Bible is the final authority. We don't add to or take away from. This is the book. We don't have another book or uh, several other books that we live by. We live by this book. And if it's not in this book, then we don't do it. If it's in this book, we do it Amen. to the best we know how. By His grace. Amen. So preachers need to be prayed for that they'll have the boldness to say what the Word of God says, even though we know it may offend some religious spirits. Amen. Let me tell you, and the reason I do that is because I love you. Amen. Those that are watching on TV, I love you. I don't, I'm not mad at you. I don't hate people that believe different than me. But I'm going to preach the Word of God. Amen? And I'm going to do my best to live what I preach. But this is perfect. And you're not and I'm not. And even whenever I'm preaching, the pure word of God still comes through a muddy vessel. See, I'm not the knower of all things. He is. That's why you better be listening to the Holy Spirit anytime you go to church. You better be trusting in God when you're listening to the preacher. Trusting in God when you're going to the doctor. Trusting in God when you go before the courts. Trusting in God when you go see a lawyer or a counselor. Or you better be trusting in God when you're getting married. You, you, you better be trusting in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That's what the Word of God teaches us. Look with me over here to Proverbs 17. Verse 28. I love some of these Proverbs. They're so practical. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, so that, that might be some of us here tonight, is counted wise when he holds his peace. In other words, when you can learn to be quiet, even if you're a fool, you look wise. But there's some people that just can't be quiet. You ever met people that they, they, they got to talk all the time? In fact, while you're talking to them, they're not listening to a word you're saying. They're just waiting for them to talk. Now, if you find yourself doing that, maybe you need to think about that. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Wow. That sometimes the best thing to do is just shut your mouth. Because even if you're a fool, you look wise when you're quiet. And the multitude of words, they're, they're, there's, there's some problems. I mean, sometimes we just talk too much. I've been there, done that. had to repent a couple of times for that. Uh, chapter 21 of Proverbs. Verse 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Got to watch what we say. Isn't that practical? You know, but some people say, I, I just I got to just tell them what I'm thinking. No, you don't. Not every time. Amen. Look with me, uh, Proverbs 26. Start with verse 17. I love these Proverbs. He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel that is not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. There's some things just ain't none of your business. You ever seen people who stick themselves in somebody else's business and then they wonder why they got bit or hurt or whatever? It tells you, you're like, 
And, and I, now I believe he's talking about a pit bull right here. You know, I mean. So he who passes by and meddles in a quarrel that is not his own. You know, there's some, some things ain't worth fighting for over. Is one who takes a dog by the ears. And a madman who throws firebrand arrows and death is like a man who deceives his brother and says, I was only joking. We should love one another, not deceive one another. This, now, this, it's not saying that you can't have friends and have practical jokes sometimes. But when your joke has malice in it and it hurts somebody else, that's what he's talking about. He says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no gossiper, tailbearer, and my Bible actually has, has under it gossiper, it says, strife ceases. So when, when there's no wood put on the fire, the fire goes out. In other words, when we, start, when we stop talking about something, that goes away. But a, a, a gossiper, a, a someone who whispers all the time, they, they keep throwing wood on the fire. Wood on the fire. And I tell you, I, I have to learn the hard way that Sometimes when a, somebody has a problem with me, the best thing to do is just speak the word because the word is water. And quit talking about the problem because every time I kept talking about the problem, it's like throwing wood on the fire. And, and when, when somebody would leave the church when I was a younger pastor, I'd get all nervous and upset and, and I would want to go and I would always go and say, what's wrong? Why did you leave the church? And then all of a sudden we'd be talking about the problem. And I learned there's still sometimes you need to do that, but sometimes you just got to let God deal with them. Amen. Amen? Amen? You can live at peace with some people, but some people you can't. So you keep throwing wood on the fire, wood on the fire, and you wonder, why doesn't this go away? Because you don't shut up. You know, sometimes in, in your relationships, you can get into a disagreement, an argument, and it's over. And everybody's at peace, and then you're going to bring it up again? He said, let me give me a little bit of wood. We're going to throw in the fire, kindle this thing up a little bit. Then it says this, as charcoal is to burning coal and wood to fire, so is a contentious man who kindles strife. Now, God help me. Somebody say, God help me. Now, if you in any kind of relationship, this can be you, it can be that other person, it can be both of you at some times. It's like when the argument is over, but it's not over with you, so you keep chasing them around the house and you can't shut up, you still got to talk about it. You got to keep putting some charcoal on it. Contentious man. See, and anger will do that in a man. When a man gets angry, it's like he, do, he doesn't know how to turn that, that faucet off. He'll keep on and on and on and on. And it's time sometimes you've got to learn to turn it off. Somebody say amen. amen. Good practical stuff. Change your life. It'll help your relationships. Let's see, we always talk about the contentious woman. It says it's better to live in the attic than with a contentious woman. But they've got contentious men too. It says, the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. People, what's the gossip today? Ooh, tell me, tell me. And they go down into the innermost body. And let me tell you, it's like gall in your gut. It'll make you sick. Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with, with silver dross. It looks pretty on the outside, but on the inside, it's nothing but dirt. He who hates discusses it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. And when he speaks kindly, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered with deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the whole congregation. So if somebody's doing some hating on you, you just be quiet and let God take care of it. Come on, trust in the Lord. Let, let, let God do, deal with some of these things. 
Verse 27. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. Wow. Hate. See, our anger and hatred and these things, it gets in our mouth and it destroys everything around us. And the devil just has a heyday with it. We meddle in things that we don't need to be meddling in sometimes. We continue to want to prove ourselves. And see, that comes from pride, too. When you're proud, when you think you're right all the time, you don't humble yourself, you will, you're, you're just like Cain. He says, sin's lying at the door, and it's desires for you, but rule over it. It's crouched down like an animal waiting to jump, and you have authority over it, but if you don't take authority over it, it'll jump in there. But guess what? God can still redeem that when you repent. Aren't you glad? And it says, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So, you know, some people will flatter, and it's actually called divination. They're flattering to get in to destroy you. Think about it. Go with me to the book of James, chapter 3. Jesus' words are spirit in their life, is what it says in John uh, 6.63. And you know John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I come to give life and life more abundantly. But we have a covenant with God, and that covenant is activated by the faith in our heart and the words that come out of our mouth. In fact, that's how you get saved. You believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. This, this truth is so powerful. So you've got to hear the word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. So when you hear the word of God, and you believe it in your heart, and then you confess it with your mouth, and God causes it to come to pass. Look at verse 2, James 3, 2. For we, are, for we all stumble in many things. Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. If anyone does not stumble in word, if you're not offended in word, he is a perfect or mature man able to bridle the whole body. So if you can get your tongue under control, you can control your life. Woo! That's what he's saying right here. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at a ship. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Now, he's comparing a bit in a horse's mouth and the rudder on a ship to our tongue directing our lives. Now, get this. It, have y'all, anybody ever uh, flew across country in an in a airplane, a, you know, a, a jet? They take off from New Orleans and we go into New York City. Well, they have headwinds, crosswinds and all that. So he takes off, he sets New York City, but then here comes, a, a, you know, a hundred mile an hour east wind. And, and he just starts going off track. And next thing you know, we're landing in Africa. And we say, well, it was just the will of God. We would go to Africa. That's if you're going to let circumstances rule your life. It's not the will of God where you end up. Not when you've got a rudder that can get you on track and you get where you're supposed to be. Now, I happen to do a little bit of sailing. But you better trust me when you get in a sailboat with me and you're taking off into the ocean. They don't have a motor on it. We've got to get back to where we left from. And it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing. Now, how many of y'all know a little bit about sailing? A little bit, huh? Now, this is what's interesting. When, when you're in a sailboat, you think the sailboat's going to go where the wind blows it. No, it goes where the pilot turns the rudder and makes it go. In fact, if there's a north wind blowing straight at you, you can still go north. Do you all know that? I've, I've taught this before. And... and uh, Physics, once you kind of get it in your head, you can understand. You, let the, you, you get out there and you let the wind blow you, 
in that direction. So you start, let's say it's a 30 mile an hour wind. You're going to start going 30 miles an hour and you've got to turn real quick. And you ever seen how the thing does like this in the movies and it knocks people off the boat, the boom? You've got to turn back into the wind at an angle and all of a sudden the 30 mile an hour wind that was coming this way glances off of the, uh, the uh, sail and it slides and now you're moving 20 miles an hour into a 30 mile an hour wind and you can go 40 miles an hour against the wind because that rudder sliding. It's like squeezing a watermelon seed. It's sliding you like that. Now you can't go directly into it. That's why you go in this way, then you gotta cut across this way. Well, don't lose your momentum because you'll have to turn back around and get going again. But you gotta cut real quick. That's why you gotta do, do it real fast and you go back into the wind. That's why the, those boats start doing like this because they're going into the wind and they're going faster into the wind than they could going with the wind because the pilot is directing the ship where he wants it to go. But most people say, well, if the wind's blowing from the north, we're going south. Must be the will of God. No, you've got control. How about if you just get on a horse? The horse got a bit in his mouth? You just kick him, ooh, wherever he goes, that must be the will of God, where I'm gonna go. Then why did you put a bit in his mouth? But you still have to be skilled. So guess what? You've got to get skilled on how to use your word, your, your tongue too. Use this word that's in your lap. It takes, it takes practice. You've got to become skilled at it and use it. You've got to learn it. It's like any trade you do. But this right here is more important than anything else. This will change your life. Listen how he finishes this. Even so, the tongue is like a little member and boasts great things. How great a forest a little fire kindles. So you could just say one little thing, it could turn into a forest fire. That's what he's saying. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. That's sin, unrighteousness, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. So listen to what the tongue does when we don't let it, when we don't control it. It defiles our body. It's set on fire. It's, it sets on fire the course of nature. It means that your circumstances control you and it's set on fire by hell. The enemy's plan begins to come to pass in your life. Don't you think you need to get control over your tongue? He says, every beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. You need the Holy Ghost. You need God's Word. You need to think the way God thinks. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Oh, the tongue sounds like a bad thing when it's not bridled and controlled by God. With it we bless our God and Father. Oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And with it we curse men that no good rotten Who have been made in the sim similitude of God? That's why we need to say what God says about one another. Ronnie, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're God's son. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. Everything you touch is going to prosper. When you've got friends like that in your life, that's a friend. Amen. I can tell you the man who speaks those kind of things into my life more than anyone I've ever met before is Philip Baker. He does not call me on the phone or talk to me or write me a letter or send me email or anything that does not do anything but build me up and speak to the man that God has created me to be. I mean, after I talk to him or read his email or get a letter from him, I'm like, whoo, let's jump over a wall, run through a troop. I can do it. Amen. We can do that for one another. Amen. Go home and, and, and your spouse, if they're not here, go home and just build them up. Tell them how wonderful they are, how, how great it is that you, you married the best man, the best woman on the planet. You just, they're going to look at you and say, just speak over them the word of God. Speak those things that be not as though they were. Amen. That's faith. See, speak. If you don't have it, it might be because you haven't been saying it. And Sunday morning, if you didn't get that message, when we're offended, 
We get tunnel vision and all we see is the problem in everybody else's life. We don't see the good in them no more. When you get offended at a church, you walk into church, all you're going to see is what's wrong with the church and not what's right with the church. Amen. And the Bible says, don't be offended. Great peace of them that love thy law and nothing shall offend them when you love God's word. You got to release it. You got to let it go. You say, how do you do that? When you realize that God loved you and forgave you, then you're going to forgive. Amen. How many of y'all, uh, who was here Sunday morning, heard the message? Don't you think everybody should get that message? I do. I need to get and listen to it about three times myself. So he goes on, and he, we're going to end right here. He says, uh, we bless God, but we curse men in verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring bring forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives and a, vine, uh, a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring can yield both salt and fresh water. I mean salt water and fresh. Come on, it's either one or the other. Make the tree good and its fruit good, and make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Uh, uh, so many ways Jesus says it. The Word of God says it. Be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. Amen? Let's get control over our tongue. I got so many more scriptures right here. So I'm going I'm to ask you all to do a little homework. I want you to read the story in Matthew, I mean in Mark. Uh, where is it? Mark chapter 11, where Jesus speaks to the fig tree. And then when you get to verse 22 through 24, that's what I want you to focus in on. That's where he says that if you say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and does not doubt in your heart but believes that those things you say will come to pass, you will have whatever you say. Isaiah 57, he says, I create the fruit of your lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it shall eat its fruit. God will create what comes from your heart and out of your mouth for you, whether it's producing death or it's producing life. Let's make a decision to make a covenant with God to keep his word in our mouth. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we want to become skilled in the word of God. We want to learn how to use that two-edged sword, that weapon that you've given us, to defeat the enemy and to set the captives free. Lord, I thank you that it is a two-edged sword and it's sharp and it's living and it's powerful. It's your word. Lord, put a desire in our hearts to meditate on it, to learn it, to let it fill our hearts so that faith will come. And Lord, we'll do like you. We'll speak to the mountains. We'll speak to the sea and calm the storm. We'll speak and the servant will be healed. We'll speak. Because you made us like you, a speaking spirit, God. Lord, let us learn to release that power by using our faith that you've given us to speak your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, lift his counts upon you and give you peace. I bless you tonight in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.